Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for a very special screening of Identifying Features. This film was the winner of the Gotham Award for Best International Film and the Audience Award and Best Screenplay Prize at the Sundance Film Festival. Um, this is offered courtesy of Kino Lorber, and we're going to screen the whole film, which runs about uh, an hour and 35 minutes here directly in the webinar. And then we're gonna come back for a live Q&A with director and co-writer Fernanda Valades and producer co-writer Astrid Rondero, moderated by SCA MFA candidate, Nana Adwoa Frimpong. So um, thank you all so much again for joining us. Please stick around for the Q&A and um, I hope you enjoy the film. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us now for the Q&A. Uh, before I introduce our guests, I just wanted to briefly mention that if you'd like to ask a question, um, put it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom panel and then we will, um, we'd love to call on people to actually join us as panelists to ask your questions live with your video on if you're comfortable with that. And if not, when you type up your question, just ask the moderator to read. Um, so I'm very excited to introduce you to the director and co-writer Fernanda Velades and the producer and co-writer Astrid Rondero. And uh, we have our moderator, uh, Nana Frimpong, uh, who will take it away from here. So very excited to have all of you here. Thank you so much for joining. And uh, Nana, it's all yours. Thanks, Alex. Hello, Fernanda and Astrid. So nice to meet you. Thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure and an honor. Thank you so much. I'm Fernanda and Astrid. So nice to meet you. Um, and thank you for bringing to us such a beautiful, poignant and timeless film. Um, so I'm excited to get into it and talk to you more. So um, my first question for you, Fernanda, I know that this idea for, the, for a feature length film um, took place in 2011, um, but can you just take us from how it became a short film to the feature length we see now, how that developed? Well, uh, at that point, I was still a student and um, I began writing about violence. I didn't know at that time really what I wanted to do. It even began uh, as an idea for a documentary. And at that point, um, we, we, we were both researching and, and reading and we came across different documents and, and journalistic reports. And it was Astrid actually who found a note in, in a blog that was called Blog del Narco, Blog of the Cartels. And at that point, I think we didn't have much information in the traditional media about what was happening, this search of violence. And it was in that blog where we searched for information and, and different chronicles and, and basically, I think, testimonies of the violence. And there was this um, narrative about a survivor of uh, a kidnap from a bus. And I think that was the seed of the idea. And it merged with other things we were reading about, especially the families and the mothers of, of those people going missing. So the short uh, was born from there, but I always, I think, had the idea of making a feature out of that. And I was very, very uh, frustrated with the result of the short because I, I felt it didn't express uh, the death and, and the wife of the humanitarian crisis we're living in Mexico. Mm -hmm. and, and for that reason, um, Astrid, can you talk about what you came on to do in the feature length film, how the collaboration between you two worked after that? Yeah, we've been working together for a long time. We've been like ever since film school. In fact, I, I was also the producer at, at, for, for her short film. And she was really adamant about wanting to, to, to revisit the story. She wanted to do it all, all over again. At some point I was really skeptic and I was telling her, but we already did the short and 
perhaps we should move on and try to find another story. But she was really clear at some point, and that was the thing that really convinced me of going along with it. It was that she felt like it was like the short had like the core of the story, but she wanted to really, really make like a like a broader view of what was happening because it's it's a, a terrible thing that we're living in and it happens in all levels of society. So that I think that was the thing that made me um, realize that it was uh, that it was important to do it, especially at the moment we are living now. Um, it, the, the government change and all that, and we were really hopeful that things were going to change in that regard. But it, it just it's just the same. It's and so that's why I think that we made the right decision. Fernanda was really, really, she was really clever of trying to follow that story because uh, there's so much to understand through that story of this boy going missing as he tries to reach the border. When you speak of um, the moment, you just spoke of the moment um, that we're in, living in right now or that we've lived in in the past year, few years. Um, I'm interested to know how long did it take you to, to make this film and did the scope of the film or what you wanted to say or what we were looking to say in the film change um, as things in the world changed? I think it was inevitable that the film and the original idea changed according to, to the developments in, in Mexico and I think also in the relationship with the US. And um, even though the core remained kind of the same, the story of this mother making a journey trying to find her son and, and, and finding a son who has become a killer uh, because of the circumstances. Um, that remained the same, even though I think a lot of the context was changing. And at some point when we were writing the feature and, and we were unsure what might come of this project, I think in Mexico, there was an atmosphere of not wanting to revisit stories about migration or violence. I think at that point, uh, people was fed up with violence. We, we were all watching in, in, in the media. Every day was, it was corpses and, and disappearances. And I think that made us realize that we had to broaden the scope of the story uh, and to introduce different characters that made us express, so that helped us express that this crisis was not only about migrants and not only about people living in, in rural communities, but was really affecting um, the whole of, of the social um, body, I think. Before we move forward, um, ladies, is, there's like a cricket or a ticking sound behind you. Is that, is that like a fan or something? No, probably it's just a grasshopper. Just a grasshopper. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> no, no worries. Yeah, we can no. close the door. Perhaps that, that will fix yeah, it. Yeah. Probably it will work better, right? I it's better it right now. It's work better. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, it was um, grasshopper. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so much better, yes. Um, so about this film, Astrid, I've heard you talk about the importance of writing about a situation, not necessarily the specific of any person's story as to incite um, empathy to, to your audience, to your viewer. Can you elaborate on why that was important for this film? Well, I think that the, one of the things that we, we got from the short story and that we felt that was very powerful and it's powerful here in Mexico is the story of, of a mother because the mothers became like a very powerful force trying to find their loved ones and trying to make justice and all that. So. I basically Fernanda and I we were we were talking about when we were writing in how can we make the people care for this boy because these stories sometimes when you and that's something that happened a lot here in Mexico some years back when we didn't understand how this was happening that we just watch those boys as as like part of the cartels and these these boys like they they go crazy and they turn into mass killers but later we understood as the things evolved here in Mexico that they were also part of a very tragic, like a tragic saga of these boys, like they're trying to reach the border and have a, a different life and somehow they get kidnapped and somehow they turn into like slaves a little bit. And that's something that, that really 
got into to us when we read this account Fernanda told at the beginning that, that we found in a, in a blog about about these boys and so I think that the main element in this story the only way we we could get away with this story was if if the where I don't know <laughs> if if we really care about the characters if we really care about this mother trying to find a, a young boy that you feel like it's very innocent and and then you you can see how he turns because because it's something like it's just uh, just like a tragic situation like he he tries to it, it's a survival yeah survival instinct, yeah. And, and in the end it's it's enforced recruitment exactly that's the, the, I think that that's something that we realized in in that account that it was like they were slaves at some point they just like get kidnapped they they made this these boys killed somebody kill somebody and then these boys are like they they don't have a way to to run and especially in a country I don't know Fernanda is very good telling how how bad our justice system here in, in Mexico works but it's it's terrible and the, the, the numbers are really terrible. yeah in, in Mexico over 90 percent of the crimes go unpunished so uh, everyone can kill and and the odds say that that person will go unpunished you are in many ways writing into a wound um, of so many of, of the characters. They're, they're carrying so much life and, and so much history in their bones. And um, you know, you have so many wonderful and powerful moments of silence in the film, but then you also have these really beautiful moments of dialogue between characters. And I'm thinking of like when Pedro says of his son, what did he gain by leaving? Or when Miguel even says to Magdalena that he would have never come back had he not been deported. And I'm interested to know, um, were these bits of dialogue or conversations, conversations that you two were having with each other as co-writers or were these things that came out of the people that you spoke to in the communities that you, you, you spoke to? Well, I, I think it's a little bit, bit of both. Uh, we, we tried to, to read a lot of research and especially about migration. We did talk a lot with with young people. And I think that's one of uh, the circumstances that I feel close to because I, I was born in, in a state that every year it spells, it is only the first or second or third place in, in Mexico of uh, ex expelling migrants. So everyone in my hometown has a relative or a friend that has gone undocumented to the United States or come back deported. And, and I think to that, we feel very, very close to, but also, and, and, and that's one of the things we, we do a lot as we write, we do write in, 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 in a loud voice and we reenact those dialogues and we, we try them, we, we want them to, to feel human. The, so we try the dialogues so they feel human and that's something very important. And that's something that we, um, we feel, well, I especially feel that sometimes Latin American films or films that are celebrated abroad in Europe or in the United States are mostly without dialogue. And we felt it was really important to give these characters uh, a voice and a, a voice that felt close to emotionally close. Another potent character I would say in the film is, is that of landscape and the way that you utilize landscape. Was that something that was part of your writing process? Did you know that you wanted to use landscape to, to tell an, an, another layer to the story? Well, yes, probably, but not that term. <laughs> okay, tell me that I should answer it. Yes, it probably had to do that with the short film because we, we, we felt like the short film was like some kind of a rehearsal. And, we knew the, the location very well. So we knew that the, those landscapes are really powerful. And that's something that I think it's really sad because you can see the, the photographs, for instance, of the journalists that they found where they found people like the massacres and all that. And you can see the, the Mexican rural landscapes are just beautiful. And it's just like this, it's very contradictory. How do you say it? Like contradictory or yeah. yeah. That, that, that in, in those places, so ter terrible massacres happen and, and a lot of poverty. Also, there's a lot of poverty. So I think that we wanted to, to give this presence 
like a nurturing presence also for the for some scenes with where Magdalena is just walking and trying to reach a place where she basically don't know how to get there or whatever that we we Fernanda was really really wanted to 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 like this this like the landscape was like nurturing her and, and just like containing her in some way like and we discussed a lot about that while we were writing to to make a, a visual approach to the landscape to express the emotions of the characters and not only the the reality outside but kind of a map of what was happening inside or, or like as you said uh, sometimes just accompanying the emotional atmosphere yeah. and fernanda can you also speak to how that translated to the discussions you had with your cinematographer because another thing that is true is that color is such an important plays such an important role in the film and it almost feels like it book notes different chapters of magdalena's journey well, that that's something we discussed and, and it's kind of those things in the movie where you say okay let's let's change the color as the story progresses and it begins uh kind of greenish and then it becomes yellow and then it becomes red and it becomes magenta and it doesn't really mean specific things but we wanted to to make this emotional journey beginning with a color and in it surely doesn't translate like that, but we wanted to, to, to begin with green and, and, and end with the opposite color, with, which is magenta, and just having a final shot that contains uh, all the colors we used in the film. Just as a, as a metaphor that in the end, this woman finds a truth that is contradictory, but she kind of uh, makes a peace with that. She embraces this kind of the truth and, and um, I, so like I was saying it doesn't really express it like that in the film because in the end colors doesn't mean anything but but I think it might help to the sensation that she needs uh, a journey. Mm -hmm. Another thing is I'd love to speak to you about is is perspective because so many times Magdalena, we, we don't see who she's talking to and the camera is positioned behind someone else's shoulder as we look at her. What were you looking to do and say with that perspective? I think uh, it was really important for us to make an emotional journey. So we, we were discussing even from the script ideas about how to be really close to the character and and we we wrote it like that sometimes we well we would only see her face without seeing the rest of the characters trying to focus on her emotions and her questions and her fears and and try to be really selective about what was inside the frame and what was outside and to be honest that also is related to a tight budget and when we realized we couldn't put everything we wanted in front of the camera, it became, or well, we tried that it was also a creative decision and not only a, a budgetary decision. But also because of the partiality of how the mothers and the families of the, of the victims, of the people that get lost in Mexico, like when they make the journey to find their loved ones, they really don't know where to turn to, who are these people they're talking to. So it's very partial. So I think that's something where we were writing that we, it was uh, like uh, an important feeling to, to communicate how these they, they these people go to an unknown journey they don't know who they're talking to yeah and how did that conversation extend into um the presence of the 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 devil you know emerging from the flames because so many times we hear the violence it's off camera we see the results of the, of the violence you know the blood splattering on the face but we don't see it exactly so um, what were you looking to do in that respect with, with having the devil um, like emerge from the flames? Well, that, that was one, I think, one of our most important conversations. We have already decided that the point of view was going to be very partial, like Astrid said, to, to help convey the sensation of making a journey to the unknown. But at some point, um, I wasn't sure about how to to shoot the scenes of violence and, and the way we work 
sometimes we write out loud, sometimes Astrid uh, gives the script a pass along, and sometimes and then I, I, I give it a pass along. And I was writing by myself, and I, I was conscious that I was overwriting the violence, the details, and it became gory and, and kind of, um, well, in Mexico, we say almost like a pornography of violence. And when Astrid read it, uh, she realized it was the completely wrong approach because of what we had already decided. But I was out of ideas. And it was her idea to use symbols and metaphors, visual metaphors, instead of uh, an actual uh, depiction of violence. And once we, we decided that, I think, it was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was like we, we began to have fun. It was very it was very different because when you're doing all these gory details, you just feel like you don't know how much is too much and you don't know if you're stripping humanity out of, of, of the characters. And when the, and when the, the image of the devil came in, everything just like for Fernanda, some, some things started to explode and she would say, perhaps this guy, he won't see that well and we can we can work with with this like out of focus sensation so everything is like it was, it was the best decision of that and i think that it's and also feel like when you get into this journey through the eyes of this woman in the in rural mexico like all the aspects of catholicism here in mexico are just so so powerful that immediately you understood that you're watching the worst of the worst in, in of, of the things that human can humans can do to each other yeah, I'm, you know, you two have spoken about t telling this film or or making this film as a way to process, you know, your own feelings of what's been happening. Um, I'm interested to know, how do you take care of yourself in the midst of telling such a difficult story? Like, what does, what does your own practice of preserving yourself in the midst of storytelling look like? Well, to... To be really honest, I think being a fiction, we, we weren't thinking we were in any kind of danger. Um, I think the danger really is for journalists and, and Mexico is one of the most dangerous places to, 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 be, a journalist. to be a journalist, particularly uh, an investigative journalist. And, and we benefited from that because we have all those research that we just could go to and, and that could just take us really close to the human testimonies, not only like the statistics and the numbers, but to try to put faces and stories in, 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 in to people's lives and, and deaths. So I don't think that was an issue. It kind of was when we were shooting because then we were out there in, in a community that we didn't know at the time it was become really dangerous but, but i think we can do all of that well basically and that's something that in mexico happens a lot that, that the violence uh, starts changing and changes in, in geography perhaps he stayed sometime in, like in 2010 was a hotbed and later on it changes to another state so when we were shooting we didn't know that a lot of vi uh, violence was starting to, to unfold and we were really lucky because we were very well like in a very close community that they they knew us very well so and they also knew that we were like like some kind of doing some kind of a, a short film or something like that for that we were students or whatever and they didn't feel like we were doing something that that was um dangerous for them or whatever so we we were really really lucky but in the other way, I was I was thinking that her question, I felt that it was more like about our emotions. emotional aspect, which I think it's I, I, that's a question I've never heard. Uh, it's very interesting because I think that's that's the like the nature of of of, of cinema when you're when you're shooting, it's like you're in a game, like you're playing and you're with your friends and you're having basically even in, in the worst days because of many things you're having fun and i think that perhaps the, the hardest parts were the hardest parts in the story as well the the boss the boss scene for instance was really hard on the on the extra the people that were helping us 
And when we were in the middle of, of nowhere in, in the dark, perhaps you were just like focused on the story and the, on, on the, the drama that was happening in, the, in, in front of the camera. But we were outside, like as a producer, I was outside watching that scene. And I really, I really felt very, very saddened of the things that we are living in Mexico and how so many people are just losing their lives. So I think that we are in a very privileged position when we're doing films to, to get to, to feel for the others as and being and be safe at the same time. It's just such a strange um, position to be in. Mm -hmm. Astrid, you spoke of the, the actors um, just now, and I'm interested to know, because I know that you worked with professional actors and, and non-actors. So how did that how did that pan out? How did that collaboration work? Um, and what do you think it added having a mix of um, all different types of actors on the production? What did that do for it? No, I think I, I, me as an outsider, because I was always working with Fernanda very close by, and I, I watched that it was the right way to go. I, I, Fernanda and I, we've been working together for forever and she knows that I really respect and love to work with, um, with professional actors. But I think that there's something that you, at, at least in this film, that we needed from real people. And, and that, that's something that Fernanda can tell you. Well, I, I think because many of, of the characters are young people and I think uh, young actors and the really actors they're just young people uh, having experiences even though they might have some uh, experience in film or theater but I really wanted to to work with teenagers that uh, were related to to these kind of realities so um, we went to local high schools and junior high school to interview um, just young men. And, and, and I think not only the story, but the script also benefited from those stories. And, and when we were casting and they told us about one of them had already tried to cross the border and they got lost in the desert, they almost died and they had, they actually, Cross the border, but they couldn't reach the point where people were waiting for them, so they had to turn back. And he was just a 14-year-old boy with all this kind of wisdom and pain. And, and I think for us, it, it was a lesson in, in empathy, uh, I think. And I think our, our objective was to take those experiences to the film but also to try to make the film a good experience for them. Because in, in the end, these kids who are really uh, underprivileged and are facing very serious decisions uh, in those communities that they can become uh, migrants, they can be enrolled in organized crime, or they can remain in, in, in their communities for, with a lack of opportunities that is very dire. So I think that that was something we tried to do to make this film also uh, an enriching experience for them. Mm -hmm. You've received so much love and attention internationally for this film, but I'm interested to know um, how your own communities have responded to the film and have you been surprised by um, the reception? Yes, definitely, I, I think it was such a small film and, and it was so hard to finance and it took us so long to develop that when we were shooting, we weren't thinking about what would be of this film once it was finished. And, and I think it came as, as a big surprise. I yeah, especially think. perhaps especially we were worried in Mexico because uh, as Fernanda said before, perhaps um, the audience is kind of tired of these stories. They just don't want to hear about it. And so we were worried that perhaps we will, they, they will watch the film with, with good eyes or whatever. But I think that there's something really truthful in this film and they they feel it. And, and, and we received like a, a lot of love here in Mexico and a lot of things start, well, at least it, it, it ignites like the conversation about, about the, the the violence that's still happening, and that that's a, a just like like um, 
like an example, it's like even with the COVID pandemic and we're in lockdown in some states, the violence has, how do you say, right? So has, has planted. planted. So it's it's even it's even worse than than the year before or the, the previous year, like 2019. So it tells a lot of, of in, in which in which place we are in Mexico. Mm -hmm. I, I think what we wanted to do, and and we were not thinking about audience or, or reception when we were doing the film, but we were we did try to make it emotional more than rational than to talk about emotions and, and, and feelings and, and the faces that could uh, make us think of real people more than vague ideas or concepts. And I think perhaps that's uh, what helped this film to make contact with people despite the cultural differences. Astrid, could you um, elaborate more on what it meant to finance this film or, or get financing for this film, what that journey looked like for you? Well, it was kind of difficult because at the point when Fernanda finished her, her well, we finished the script and she was ready to, to finance. We already did a film before and we have like a, like a fund that we applied. And so we applied to that fund again we were waiting for the whole budget to, to be financed through that fund and somehow the, the budget of, of, of that fund got cut in the middle so we uh, cut in half so we needed to find more like more um, financing elsewhere and it was like um, it was it was difficult it was good at some point because we met a lot of uh, co-producers and people that hop into the story and it was very very that was something very important because I think that's that's, that was one of the key elements that helped us like getting to some places that perhaps we would have never been before or, or whatever. And we finally applied to a tax incentive, um, incentive um, how do you say, it? like financing scheme here in Mexico. And it was difficult at some point because it was the, it was the elections at that point, the, the previous elections and the, the companies that, that, that like, how do you say, like, uh, um, it, it's a way in which uh, exactly. Mexican companies can label a percentage exactly. of their taxes so it goes directly into a film they choose. And it was really difficult to convince a company uh, because of the elections. And, and they felt that it was like a dangerous topic to talk about, even though in Mexico it doesn't work like that. You, you don't get that kind of censorship. But the companies, they, they fear, they they they... they, they Give money to this kind of film, perhaps they won't have like a like the know. government might retaliate with uh, whatever. Uh, I, I forgot the name in English. Uh, like like audit, like uh, audit, like something like tax audit or something. Something like that. So it was it was hard, but at at um, at the same time it was good for us because we finally opened up to more to more people. We started working with more producers, which was good. And at the end, we finally got the financing, but after we shot, at some point, Fernanda and I, we discussed that even without the money, we were going to go along and start shooting, and that's something that we did. And I really think it was the right decision. Even though we were, we went with to principal photography with a very tight budget, I think that it, it helped us a lot to, to, to work with the res resources we had, and especially for Fernanda. Fernanda, I, I really admire her for that because she she's really like really good uh, learning about the equipment the right equipment she's not afraid Fernanda and her DP which is another thing that's wonderful about Claudia the DP is that that they really don't think the the equipment makes a film so that was something that I think for me because I'm more old school which I think that perhaps the Alexa is the best way to go and I should <laughs> wait for the Alexa and Fernanda and Claudia they are or like, it doesn't matter if we're gonna go with a very small camera and they, they try to like, I don't know how to say it, but they, they take out the best of it. So I think it was like, when everything like gets in the right moment, the right place and, and everything went okay. After that, we, we went to San Sebastián to a work in progress. And that was the, the moment where everything changed in, our, in, in, the, in the destiny of the film. We got the, the international sales agent and all that, and, and everything just came together finally. 
we spoke a little bit about this, about, you know, the relationship between Fernanda and the DP. I, I also know that the production was mostly women and that was like an intentional choice. Can you two talk about why you wanted to make sure you had a mostly female production crew? Well, <laughs> I, I, like I like talking about because I, I think it was really, really enjoyable. Um, I, it, it might sound a little bit uh, incorrect, but I think most of us women are overqualified and, and when we work with women, it's like taking the best of the best, even though they're not recognize, recognized as, as that. And for example, Claudia, it's like the most amazing DP and, and she also knows how to operate everything, all kinds of like drones and, and or Steadicam and, and, and I don't know the, the name in English, like those, like- um, Those old cranes where <laughs> you were doing like this, well, cranes like moving, like she yeah, knows, how, she knows to... how to operate everything. And besides that, she is a great character and she's a great, companion so i think by choosing women it was also choosing people uh, that was there for the project and not the ego and we have an experience in our previous film when as a producer i wasn't careful in selecting the guys the the men that were working with us and i had the surprise that many of them were really uncomfortable working with women in, in the high positions in a film crew. So I also wanted to avoid that. And and I think I just- Well, that's something that, that I must say that, that that's something that's changing. The new generations are more prone to working with women. They're just like learning how to do it. But in Mexico, it's a very, how to say like machista place. So like a very macho place. So sometimes it's hard for the, yeah, for the, the, the guys in our generation uh, to, to work with a, a, an all-female crew. And that's something that's changing. And that's perhaps Fernanda, uh, the way she wanted to go with this film, which was a great idea because we stayed together for a very long time in a very small place. So it was all about, I don't say how, like having good relationships and, and, and the energy, everything was, just work. And, and a less and, and a less vertical structure of the crew also were even though we know uh, it, like film has hierarchies where there's a director a producer a dp and and not everyone can talk at the same time and there's kind of a discipline and an order but at the same time uh, we wanted to benefit from the ideas and the input of everyone who was creatively involved and I think that was that was really really in, enjoyable and and also I think that's one of the reasons I really really feel this film is co-authored by by the two of us of course but by but many others Claudia and the editor Susi and, and the composer and and the art uh, director and and I mean, like everyone who really invested their creativity into this film. Great. What, what a beautiful way to end talking about women, the power of women. Um, we now have a few questions in the Q&A box. And um, I know that there are a few people who I've, I will be asking on their behalf and some people we, we, we will be bringing over. Um, Alex. Yeah, so um, why don't we do this? I, read maybe read a couple of the ones that are um that don't want to be on camera and i will transfer over some of the guests that um seem like they're okay to ask their questions live and then i'll, I'll put a running order in the uh in the chat great okay alex all of these look like they would like me to read it they haven't specified so i'm not too sure please i'll read sally stein oh, the, the, yeah i mean typically the uh the ones that have well, the ones that don't want to come on, we'll put in, ask, you know, please, moderator, please ask. Cool. Okay. We'll go for Sally Stein first. So Sally Stein asks, the dialogue and the film overall do feel very human. Thank you for this searing film. But I have a question about the title. My Spanish is poor, but I think in Spanish, the title is without identifying features. But the English title is without the without and thus identifying features. Can you explain why this change in meaning? Well, um, 
before the film was premiered and, and we already had the sales agent and, and she, and well, um, they hired a publicist and we were discussing about the international title, we had non-distinguishing features and they felt it was kind of difficult to pronounce and, and perhaps not so um, strong in the idea it conveyed. And we discuss it and they propose identifying features, I think because in the end, it, it was not so important the with or without, but this uh, feeling and the sensation that uh, we were talking about um, people made anonymous because of the violence and, and only made recognizable through the love of his mother. So we, we, I think we felt uh, comfortable with that, even though... No, we weren't uh, that comfortable. We they they, they picked the title, basically. <laughs> that's, the, that's the short answer. <laughs> Next, we have um, Ramel coming over. Should just uh, take a quick second, but um, okay, so feel free to turn on. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Um, all right. Hi, Fernanda. Hi, Astrid. Uh, I'm Romel Villa. I'm originally from Bolivia. Uh, so I really wish I, we could be speaking in Spanish, but I'll try my best not to get too excited. I'm just <laughs> focus on English. <laughs> um, well, first of all, huge congratulations. Beautiful movie. Uh, very emotional. Uh, uh, I actually had two questions, if I may. Uh, the first one was, or is, um, you mentioned you know, that uh, you talked about the casting process and how uh, you went to like high school and all these other places, focusing more on like finding real characters, I guess, and more than actors, actors. So in the moment of production, what was it like directing them? You know, like uh, what, were there any challenges uh, working with the actors uh, in that regards? And um, my second question is, um, if you could please talk about what the post-production process was. You know, I'm curious to know how different the final outcome was from what was written on the script. Thank you very much. Well, about the actors, we had two professional actors. Uh, the lead actor, Mercedes Hernandez, who plays Magdalena, and David Yescas, who, who plays Miguel. And I met them when, when we shot the short film that was previous to, to this project. And I was convinced that I wanted to work with them again. But then the rest of the cast are non-professional actors. And, and some of them we experienced in local theater. I think uh, I had a lot of help from Astrid's sister, who is a professional theater actress and director in Mexico. And she has a lot of experience um, training and, and teaching young boys. I wouldn't say to act because that takes a lot of training, but to be open to the play of, of, of fiction. And, and the work she did, I think, was very helpful to us because uh, the teenagers, the boys, that, that particularly them, they were having fun and, and they really understood that, that we were playing a game of fiction and, and they were just really open to that. And about uh, the rest, about you were able to work. You want to talk about uh, the, the editing? The editing, it was a very brief process. Also because of our first feature, we, especially myself, because I edited the previous one, I like understood how important it is to, to be just like calm in the editing process, not trying to to force too much into the in the to, into the yeah into the editing room and to have like freedom and time and not having a lot of because we had in, in our previous film a lot of screening so I just devoted uh, this experience out of that I told Fernanda you should start editing and then when you feel like you have a um, more mature um, cut I can jump in and that's the the way we did it afterwards. Susan Corda, which is an amazing editor and director from, from New York. She, she has worked with us for many, for many projects. And we're really lucky to have her. She, she's really good at finding the right timing between like 
we we say like negotiating the time i'm i'm more even the way we speak like i'm always like a like a chihuahua <laughs> and Fernanda is more more like calm and she's like and that's that's the at, at some point the film when fernanda left it it was just like too long that you could just like fall asleep and then i came in and started cutting everything and susan which is a wonderful editor she negotiates those different different times and i think and we always say that she found the right timing not not of us but of the film and i think that that's something that, that we really cherish about her work and basically it didn't it wasn't that different from the from the script in fact we only lost like two sequences or something like that or three in regarding like yeah in, in terms of what, what story was left outside. no yeah. no no it was like pretty straightforward which was very refreshing and great for us awesome thank you so much thank you next we have guo shan guo shan i'm not saying your name correctly hello yes that's correct thank you yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Fernanda and uh, Astrid. It's a really great film. I really enjoy it. Uh, I have questions like, I do notice that the, the mother's name is uh, Magdalena and her son is like Jesus. It just sometimes like makes me remember of, like this uh, Christian background. So I was wondering like, were you like, were you guys like thinking about that when you're giving the characters those names? Yeah, I think uh, when, when we chose the names and, and it, it does have this religious reference that for, for us, I think it's more like a cultural reference. It really was kind of um, just strategies to take when, when you are writing to, to help you go ahead, even though uh, it, 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 it's just that, that, that reference, I think, um, so yeah. We were thinking about that. Got it, got it. Uh, yeah, thank you very much again. <laughs> thank you. Sebastian? Oh, hi. <laughs> hi, Fernanda. Hi, Astrid. And, and hi, Nana. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, um, I was just, I wanted to say that, I mean, also as a Mexican, like it's, it's very, inspiring to see other Mexican <laughs> directors and just producers and everything succeed and do great, great projects and then getting the recognition on top of that. Um, especially as like a woman director, I am like seeing like new like um, women directors in Mexico, like starting to get like a lot of recognition, like Tatiana Hueso, Lila Viles, and now you, Fernanda, it's like, oh, I'm so excited to see what <laughs> you do next. <laughs> um, and so my question really is like, um, maybe something you get a lot asked because it's the topic, um, favorite topic of discussion, but like, what are your thoughts um, on like, yeah, like the industry, film industry here in Mexico and like changes happening on it, um, or maybe particularly like regarding women directors, but also like in general, do you think, um, especially as like an industry that's often talked about as like being stuck and being um, like very divided also like between like commercial films and um, more artistic films, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think in, in Mexico, we are very lucky to have still uh, some public funds that allow us to make the films we love without uh, thinking about um, that we won't be able to make those films if they don't please the audience. And, and so we have a lot of creative freedom, even though of course we want people to, to watch them. And I think that has, that has been a boost for, for the industry. What we have been experiencing in, in the past year is that those films have been reduced and, and, and cut back um, well, that's something that worries us uh, because in, in Mexico, films depend almost in 50% from those public funds. So uh, I think we both feel very committed to, to defending the, those funds. And, and to, be, uh, to be honest, we don't have a lot of uh, options 
if, even to make commercial films, to make commercial films, and, and that's something we're discussing right now. There's a, a law in progress in, in the Mexican Congress. We need to renegotiate some international treaties or to appeal them because uh, Mexican law defends Hollywood films. So uh, our films don't even get uh, 10 to 15 percent of the screen time in, in Mexican cinemas. So I think that's like the context and, and the reason why this public funding is so important because there, are, there really are, is much option for private financing because films in Mexico are not really commercial. There's no possibility for them to, to, to gain money. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we have Catherine Kramer. Hey. Oh, uh, yeah, extraordinary film. Um, but you know, I, I've had such a long day and if I hadn't seen that title on the invitation, I would have skipped the movie. I'm so glad I didn't. So I have to agree with your publicist that that was, a wonderful choice for the international audience. And, um, and also because it applied so well to that doctor character, who I would bet was one of your professionals. Um, she was so great and she was so vital. You know, it just, we, when she goes dos semanas, we just empathize so much with her pain, her loss and how fresh the loss is for her. Um, the other thing was the devil really in, intrigued me, but you kept showing these transfixing landscapes. And when I got to the one which looked like floating trees or a reflection of almost trees in a pond, I'm just going, how did they do this? But, but it was like you were saying constantly, this is a land that can be heaven or it could be hell. And of course the religious biblical names uh, resounded with that. So if you could talk a little bit more about how you achieve that, that floating tree shot, I'd appreciate it. And thank you very much. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm gonna tell my mom because my mom played the doctor and, and she's <laughs> <laughs> gonna be very happy. Yeah, very happy. <laughs> um, so you, you know you should have the it because you were the, the drone operator as well. <laughs> well, I when we were writing and and I felt like we had to do a lot of landscapes and we discussed about that how to shoot the landscapes. Uh, we had the idea of using drones, not to make a lot of movement, but just to to put the characters in in a wide uh, landscape. But when we got to, to this pond, to this lake, it's, it's actually a, a dam um, uh, in, in near the place where we shot. We, we, we were fascinated by, by all these birds and, and, and we were just almost by accident making tests with, with the drone. And at some point, uh, Claudia, the DP, and, and myself felt like we wanted to photograph the reflection and to try to do it uh, upside down to kind of uh, convey this idea that this character was returning for her adopted son in, in, um, in this very uh, like emotional whirlwind. Uh, but we couldn't do it with the drone and we tried and tried. So uh, when we were still shooting, I made some just test, uh, do it in, in Final Cut and, and it worked. So we went back to try to find the correct light and just try to frame it, uh, thinking that we were going to put it upside down in post-production. And, and that's what we did. We reversed it and, and put it upside down and, and tried to operate it thinking about that. And 
it was, it was a lot of fun uh, operating with them. Well, quite an achievement, and you're so young. I'm very impressed. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have Jules Minton. Sorry, I need to ask Jules to. Oh, there we go. Okay, great. Hi. Um, as a grizzled old screenwriter, I want to compliment the two of you at conquering a very big demon for all of us, which is exposition. The two mo scenes that conveyed the most information were brilliant in your film. The, the one where, where uh, Magdalena is talking to Rehis, um, the way you did that all in one shot and beautifully composed shot and never showed us Rehis made it just fascinating. I mean, I could not tear myself away from all of the information that was being conveyed. And the same thing later in the film with, um, I guess it was Alberto, where you kept us involved, not really through the flashback, but through the use of a non-translated native tongue. And both of those were really great solutions to having to convey a lot of information and not wanting to, you know, just do the over the shoulder shot back and forth, back and forth of people talking. Congratulations. Thank you so much. I mean, I, um, I, I look forward to seeing what you'll do next to convey a lot of information. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you, you're <laughs> teaching me lessons. <laughs> Next, we have Andrea. Hello. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. I've been looking forward to watch, to watching the movie ever since. Uh, Carlos Garcia, is Garcia his last name? I think he wrote a piece about the film on LA Times. Uh, say Carlos. Uh, yeah, I just, I mean, I just want to know, I'm also, I'm from Torreon, and I was just really excited to see uh, just just everything and be able to watch the film. I guess my question is, what do you, what's next? Which I hate that question, but I, I think I would be, I would love to hear what you guys are thinking. And also I totally understand the, I'm so happy you work with all women. It's so much <laughs> out there. You don't have to explain yourself. I celebrate it and it's inspiring. So yeah, I guess what's next. And if you have any advice on uh, us, uh, new filmmakers, I guess, emerging, whatever. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. No, no, you should tell. You should tell. Well, the, the way we work is like we we co-write and we uh, switch places, directing, producer, producing, and we do feel like we are involved in together in the whole process. So we are now uh, financing a film that also deals with violence that Ash is going to, to direct and, and, and I'm introducing and we also co-wrote. And I think when we were still writing identifying features and, and we were in this emotional uh, darkness, I think, and, and this hopelessness about what, what we are experiencing in Mexico, we were also wondering what needs to happen for a boy that is born amidst this violence to have a different life? And so our next film tries to address that question and it's a coming of age. And uh, it's the story of an orphan of the cartels that um, tries to find uh, a destiny of, of his own. So, yeah. so we're into that. So and we're you're writing. This. We're be you're beginning a new screen, right? So we're working on Yeah, that. we're we're also writing other other projects and, and the way we work it's so we, we take some time to write alone and then that writing becomes a conversation between the two of us. So what it's writing and I'm writing but that that's the next project that we um, are kind of going <laughs> No, I think we're certain that's going to become a <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. 
and, and my family is from Coahuila. <laughs> oh, yay! <laughs> Arriba el Santos. Thank you, guys. <laughs> okay, next we have Roya. In the meantime. Um, yeah. yeah. I don't know if Roya was expecting me to go. Okay. <laughs> Roya, I'll, I'll ask your question. <laughs> Did the mother declare her son dead because... She wanted to save him by making them stop looking for him or because the son was dead to her? Well, it's, it's a good question. It's a question we discussed a lot. And I think even though the scene, you wouldn't know it completely by, by the scene because all you know is she claims the body of, of, of Miguel. I think she will never stop loving her biological son, but because the situation is in, she knows she won't get him back. Uh, she, he's trapped, and 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 um, I think we both wrote that scene thinking she knows she the boy will die soon. Uh, so I think she's accepting. Um, she has lost two sons, not because she can stop loving him, but. I don't think there's a way out for him. Thank you. And um, Cynthia. <laughs> okay, so Cynthia had her hand up for a while, but uh, I'm not sure if she's able or if she's even aware that I've moved her over to the panelist side. Cynthia, do you wanna jump in? You can just use your mic if you like. Or maybe she stepped away because I didn't give her enough of a heads up. Um, there was uh, there was one thing from from the chat from the Q and A about uh, uh, the no subtitles when the old man was telling the story of what happened on the bus, and if you had any oh, like what the creative decision was there. Well, we were screening, we only did a screening before going to work in progress in San Sebastian. And we did it with our, um, uh, as, as, how do you say, like partner in, in our companies. And she's also a very, very good DP and we love her very much and we trust her. And she told us that she felt like we, we have the, the translation. In fact, the, 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 the granddaughter of, of, of Alberto Mateo made the translation and, and we, we had it with subtitles and all that. And she was the one who said that she felt like if we were, how do you say in English, like a pleonasmo, like a, it was, it, like she felt like the most powerful for way to go was to letting the image be the translation. And at, at that point, I think that it made a lot of sense to both of us, we were worried because we know it's 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 something that you were you you will naturally feel like okay the, the subtitles are going what's happening with my whatever right so yeah yeah with my Netflix or whatever so I was worried and at some point in San Sebastian they wrote me and then they 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 wrote an email telling me that some subtitles were lacking. And of course, as I'm always jumping in the situation, I said, no, no, we need to put the, the subtitles because it's not working. And Fernanda said, no, let's go with the idea. I think it's a very good idea. And, and I think at the end, even though I know there's some people that feel like they, they want to have a translation, I think that's a very, like a tour de force of what's happening at that scene with the way this character sees the life and listens because he doesn't understand Spanish. Which is something very interesting also that happens in Mexico that there's some like native people that don't don't speak Spanish and they're really like like outsiders so in, in that situation it would be like twice as difficult and I think that, that that's something that really adds to the scene but that's like um, a very precise example of how like this film uh, got nourished from ideas of the people that got invested in it because that was not our idea. Yeah, that was not idea. 
Well, I was one of those people thinking my subtitles were always <laughs> <laughs> I would be one that uh, too, of course. I would be just like it's like I would stop and just watch what's happening. Yeah, well, it was like we took a chance. <laughs> yes. It was beautiful. Well, thank you both so much. This has been such a beautiful conversation, and I'm so grateful for your time. No, oh, thank you. It was really great, and yeah. it's it's awesome talking to to young people and and yeah, just just chatting. Thank you very much thank for you. the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you all so much uh, for, for joining us tonight. And thanks to everyone who's still out there. And I hope you all have a great night. Bye. Take care. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.